Ryan Olke. What's up, dude? Good to see you, man. Good to see you. Here we are. <laughs> Excited for, for this little mini series that has emerged for us. Yeah. So, I mean, let's, let's let people know what's going on. So um, as people watching right now know, today is the first day of impeachment. So Ryan and I figured we would devote an entire show and do what reasonable, responsible, mature young men like ourselves do. And we're going to talk about video games for the next two hours. <laughs> I mean, that's go to right there. <laughs> so um, what we're actually doing, Ryan, is we're following up last month's episode. Yeah. Which, um, was really, I got to say, man, that was a good episode. That was really fun. Yeah, I mean, we've basically just uh, are, are opening up, you know, in, in the integral fashion, we're looking at every, so much of what we've talked about before through the lens of art, you know, and so we've done that through uh, movies and now we're doing video games and we have some other ideas uh, going forward. Um, right. So yeah, I think it's totally to... in the spirit. Uh, that's my justification is uh, for our, our video games. <laughs> I feel like there's like a, a mom over here, like, we're not playing video games, mom. We're talking about philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> we're not playing video games. We're inhabiting video games. And there's a big difference there. Get off my back. We're the pizza rolls. <laughs> 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 yeah so i mean again just to catch people up if you missed last month's episode i mean i highly highly recommend you check it out because what we did is we basically went through all the major levels of development uh from crimson to turquoise or from archaic to super mega uber integral and what we did is we found a number of film clips that really really sort of distill the essence of each of these stages and really uh, illustrate some of the main characteristics and qualities that are associated with each of these stages. And that was a really, really cool and fun episode. And we figured that this time we would just kind of follow that up. And we wanted to do something very similar, but this time looking at video games instead of movies. And, you know, Ryan, one of the things that I noticed was um, this was actually a more challenging in a certain yeah. way, you know, project to put together because, you know, with well, a film clip, it's like, you've got a hour and a half to you know maybe two hours two and a half hour you know very finite piece of media you can go through you can find that like little one minute yeah clip, i mean like you can you know? find a very very specific clip in a whole movie that could be about anything and it's easy to isolate and you did a fantastic job of isolating clips to demonstrate it so it was really great for that purpose and then uh, yeah and as you we discovered video games required multiple lenses in sort of assessing because we can't really isolate one little part of a game it's usually bigger dimensions of games and we you kind of identified like what we have three categories here yeah. in terms of analyzing games yeah and I'll, and I'll and I'll and I'll break that down in just a moment um yeah. because yeah no, no, that's 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 exactly right and um you know as I started compiling all these games I you know I started with a very simple algorithm right I was like well let's just sort of just like we did with films let's just look at the content of these games and kind of sort it by by altitude and the, the real simple algorithm I came up with you know just to kind of remind people we're going to be using colors here if you're not familiar with the colors we really get into it in our last episode so you might start there but I'll try to you know kind of explain some of the terms as we go but basically the idea is that um, development unfolds through a, a number of levels that take us from uh, uh, what's called crimson or archaic to magenta or magical to uh, red or egoic to amber, which is mythic, to orange, which is rational, to green, which is postmodern pluralistic, to teal and turquoise, which are sort of two different gradings of, of integral. Um, so what I did is I took that and I basically said, you know what, video game genres kind of fall pretty cleanly into these altitudes. So I started kind of breaking it down. I said, okay, well, crimson, archaic, these are sort of our, you know, our survival consciousness. Well, that's survival games. So let's just put, you know, say survival games are beige. Let's say fantasy games are magical magenta, right? Or superhero games, for example. First person shooters where your job is to kill everyone on the screen is, is red. Team playing and multiplayer uh, games like Destiny and so forth, where you mm -hmm. have to coordinate with the team in order to accomplish a certain set of goals. That's amber. Um, strategy and simulation games are orange. Green, interestingly, doesn't really have its own genre associated with it. However, there are millions of green games, uh, which is fairly interesting. Starting to, have, to emerge, like some. I, I think so. I think so. Genre. Yeah. Yeah, and we'll and we'll talk about that as we go. Sort of what qualifies as mm -hmm. green, what 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 maybe mm -hmm. doesn't, um, etc. And then teal. You know, I've got a couple ideas for what games I enact in a teal way, but I'm not necessarily 
you know, and I'll frame them as steel during this discussion, but, you know, basically I, I look at things like emergent systems and games that track multiple perspectives uh, mm -hmm. and so forth. And we've got mm -hmm. a few examples of those. So that's where I started, which was again, a very sort of simple kind of heuristic. But then as I really started to push into it, it didn't seem to hold a lot. It didn't, it didn't, it was too simple. It didn't allow me to say very many meaningful things about the games that we wanted mm -hmm. to discuss today. So I decided to actually break it down into three categories. Instead of just looking at the content, I also want to look at the framing or the theme, right? Mm -hmm. So what is this perspective through which the story is being told? And then I wanted to look at the actual gameplay mechanics themselves. What levels of, let's say, cognition are they sort of activating as we go? Yep. Um, so those are the three kind of, you know, lines of development, if you will, that we're going to be looking at with, uh, with video games across all these different altitudes. Uh -huh. um, and I think it's going to be a fun presentation. Excuse me while I just put yeah. up on. Hey, um, we're, we're, <laughs> it's video game day, so it's, a lot of things are off the table. Give me my Cheetos, yeah. my Mountain Dew. Yeah, it's really interesting. I think what's great, um, I mean, aside from if you love playing video games, and this is going to be a fun one, but... Um, you know, it shows the complexity of developmental analysis, you know, because at first it's it's really useful to understand development in a really, really simple way. So whenever I'm teaching this, I'm usually doing it through ego development, you know, egocentric, sociocentric, world-centric, planet-centric, you know, just keeping it real simple. But when we actually look at human beings, given multiple lines of development and all of these other dimensions of a human being, it gets a little bit messier and harder to like just put somebody into one bucket, even though development remains something very real and very part of the human experience. So that's kind of demonstrates this. And, you know, like even, you know, as we go through it, we'll see like uh, uh, where we might place games depending on it. Yeah, I think you did a great job of like putting them in buckets here, but that's part of the conversation of like, well, you know, I might put it a little bit here, you know, I'll put it over here. That is part of what this shows of like, we have to really contemplate and inhabit. I mean, it really requires inhabiting. Uh, in order to do this versus one scene out of a movie is a little bit easier we can just nail it by the way you got me into watching discovery uh, uh star trek discovery nice it's a fantastic show it's it's really really well done and demonstrates a lot of interesting developmental unfolding actually in the show so we we might have to devote a, a, an entire episode to inhabit your yeah we've trunk. been we've been burning through it so yeah that was awesome the of last time yeah oh uh, we'll, we'll catch up on that no and awesome points across the board right there man you know and i think the other thing too is when we're doing the film clip episode you know we, we call it inhabit your inner theater mm -hmm. the basic idea is you're not just watching these things outside of you that these things these film clips are actually signifiers for real territories within you that you get to observe in real time as you're watching these movies so it's a fun way to actually have an integral experience right you can yeah. find all this within yourself I'm viewing, I'm orienting myself to the to this video game episode in a very similar way, except instead yep. of just sort of observing these dynamics, yeah, you get to actually act them out. Yeah, you're you get, you know what I mean? Which, and, which, yeah. which means when you're playing a game that's like, let's say one of these early development games, quote unquote, you can inhabit that energy and you can yes. like have as much fun as that stage of development allows you to have without guilt, think, without remorse and without this kind of high-minded poo-pooing of a I, sort of lower I energy. I think that's fun. actually one of the good things about video games that like, for example, that doesn't seem to hold water. Now, uh, I'll say a caveat about this, but like, for example, oh, if you play a violent video game, that means you're going to be violent. And it's like, that hasn't really shown out to be the case, you know, that like, it just doesn't like, like listening to heavy metal is going to make you go do bad things. Um, obviously we can act out like, for example, addictions in all kinds of ways. And certainly are some people addicted to video games and things like that. And do they you know, act out their problems through it, sure. But it's a safe space to inhabit that much the way like sports are. Sports are like that. It's like we send, if you really just, like I love I love sports. I, I watch Super Bowl, I watch football sometimes. And, you know, if you look at it, just analyze, analyze that kind of game from kind of not the sports lens, it's like you see all the, all the dudes lined up in the tunnel, like stable, like horses. And just like, now we're going to open the doors and let everybody, let the, the, the meat on the field. And like, and now they're going to battle it out and all that. It's just like, this is like our collective way to inhabit battling without, you know, battling right minus concussions and yeah. things like that. Yeah. You know, it's like we can do the video game. So we're, yeah. yeah, I think it's great. And I also think it will 
show us where we're at. So like, depending on where a person is at developmentally, they're going to play and interpret a game very differently. And these games allow different interpretations because of that, right? So like somebody could play a game and they play it in a very red way, even those other dimensions to it. Exactly. Minecraft, as we'll talk about, is one of those ways. And just yep. examples where I could point to that you can play in a lot of ways, depending on where you're coming from. That's right. hundred yeah. percent. Yeah. And then that's, that's going to be an important factor as we, as we look at these, there's kind of like maybe a primary energy or altitude that we can hone in on. Totally. And, you know, as you said, we're putting these into buckets, but they're very leaky buckets. And that's really, I think how we have to hold integral anyway. These are not discrete categories. These things are well, in, in those they Three. bleed into each other. Yeah. And, it, and you know, and that like content theme and gameplay, you know, it's just like, that's, it allows, it allows good orientation interpretation of all these, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Well, should we start? Yeah, let's get it. All right. So a little caveat for this first clip. So um, I'm a completionist. <laughs> when I was doing this, you know, I was looking at the crimson altitude, the archaic altitude. And I'm like, you know, okay. So previously I said, I associate survival games there. But again, when I started to zoom in, it lost coherency because Minecraft, for example, is a survival game. However, survival is sort of, you know, that level is just sort of like your first and most immediate concern, and then you build on top of it, and it involves all this rationalistic gameplay and et cetera. Mm -hmm. So it's hard for me to find games that really capture- It would have to be very impulsive, kind of like an impulsively driven- Sort of. Gameplay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and there's not really a lot of that. And, and the, the other thing I wanna say too is I did not include games like platformers in this list like uh super mario brothers for example yeah because these are sort of reflex games and i think that those kinds of games fall outside of this kind of spectrum i mean you can look at some of the content of like mario brothers be like this is clearly magenta you know you got talking you're walking mushrooms and stuff it's magenta content you could argue like, play is it's you could argue like in some of that's why i immediately thought of as like any game that that where the main purpose is like a like holy shit i gotta do this thing and then like i'm either alive or dead you know and that's like a constant like amped up energy like that activates that kind of but like you said they're always usually that would be like maybe gameplay structure kind of thing like part of that would be like maybe in that kind of impulse survival oriented thing yep. um, but everything else there's a bigger you know this content and the theme and stuff yep. so yeah makes so sense. for what i did for for crimson is i chose a game that basically had uh crimson content mm -hmm. and crimson theme uh but has orange gameplay and that is a game called Dawn of Man. And I gotta say, this isn't, I mean, all the games on this list are pretty awesome. This game is okay. It's, it's a colony management game where basically you're in control of a Neolithic society. You're trying to survive. Um, I chose this game because the technology, you know, a lot of these games have technology that, uh, you know, you research and kind of compounds onto itself. This game stops pretty much at Neolithic technology. So you, you sort of stay in this era. Um, so I'm just kind of presenting this game yeah, as, yeah. you know, an example of, of a Neolithic kind of crimson content game, but the, the game yeah, yeah, yeah. itself is orange. It's a strategy. Yeah, because, yeah, because you have the, the people in it are, you know, the uh, crimson, but like you, you as a player in a, in a rational place. Yeah, because honestly, I mean, it's a good point. It's like, unless we're going to just say like, not like any video game, like the game is we put you in a stadium and release a lion. And if you survive, you win. Like. That's would be like, there you go. I mean, I don't know how else you do, or go go do survival. Like, that's probably what people really do these days is they go into those survival um, boot camp things, go in the woods and see if you can survive for a week. And we've totally. seen more of that these days. Totally. But in a video game environment, it seems really hard to do. Yeah. yeah, it is. And and again, there are a number of survival games out there. Rust is another is another one which I've never played, but those even tend to be more uh amber because a lot of it you know a lot of your survival depends on forming relationships and, and partnerships with other players and going up that so it leaves crimson really really quickly um you know, so that's why I, I chose this game yeah it is interesting i think we do see elements depending on the game type where you can maybe tap into that as one element you know like in minecraft depending on the level you're playing like you have to like eat some food right. before your food bar runs out and it's like just super basic you know which some people might find that annoying because it's just like, come on, I want to play a video game. I don't want to have to like pretend to eat food. Right. But, you know. So now we're gonna we're gonna leave the crimson bucket and we're gonna go into the magenta bucket. And this first game with magenta, I think, is gonna really show why it was so important to bring these three categories online. So we're gonna look at Spider-Man Miles Morales. So this is a game where the content of the game is purely magenta. I mean, you get to be Spider-Man. 
right? And how cool is that? I mean, I've wanted to be Spider-Man since yeah. I was like six years. I mean, I remember being on my couch and just like fantasizing about like Thwick, just grab things that I want and, you know, yeah, <laughs> yeah. fantasize about being Spider-Man. Yeah. And with yeah. this game, I can be, and it's gorgeous, but it's got magenta content. However, the theme of the game, the framing device, the story itself is being told from a green point of view. I mean, this isn't Peter Parker. This is Miles Morales. This is sort of, you know, yeah. a multiculturalization of Spider-Man, which is really, really cool and really, really exciting. So it's got strong green themes. The game itself is about neighborhood and community and right. doing what's right. And then the, uh, the actual gameplay itself is red. It's red gameplay because you're just playing as Spider-Man. You are stuck within your own perspective. Mm. You're mm. only ever playing that game and your job is to be a hero, right? Mm. So this is a perfect example of those three categories really coming to life because we've got magenta content, green theme, red gameplay. It's interesting. So like actually the one, the, um, the level of development that where I had the most questions about like analyzing games is in magenta. Mm -hmm. um, so like, for example, and then maybe it's like, who's inhabiting this, like, so versus like, what's the structure of the game? Like, what does it impose on you versus what can you interpret? And like, so normally I'm thinking like, well, everybody knows Spider-Man. If you're playing Spider-Man, you know, Spider-Man. So like, you know that, yeah, you, you are a hero, but you're a hero for a green theme. So would that very, really be red, you know, just to be, because, you know, heroes, you're always going to be an individual, even mm -hmm. if you're a part of a group. So like, um, that's a question for me of like, oh, is it red versus like, um, like Grand Theft Auto, when we talk about that one, that's like, how you play is, is red, you know, like, it's Hendy. like, and that'll be that'll be the one well one yeah 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 i mean like you know? it's it's like when it happens it's it's like heavier like it feels very red like you know like there's even part of like oh am i gonna play this game um but yeah that's kind of an interesting thing around some of the superhero stuff that i, I was kind of wondering about you know yeah so you um, know again when i when i'm focusing on gameplay i'm yeah. really trying to focus in on what exactly are the concrete operations that you as a gamer are doing how uh -huh. are you interfacing with it so uh -huh. that's so I'm being kind of rigid with how I'm doing games. Yeah, yeah. That's why I say it's red. You're right that you're 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 playing in a red style for green reasons. These are sort of the the mm. justifications for being a hero. Gotcha. But the actual gameplay is gotcha. Okay, right. cool. That that makes sense. That explanation there. Yep. And uh, for magenta, can you tell me like uh, your interpretation interpretation here? Magenta content is that like you know. The kind of Fantasy. surreal like movements, you know, like that you have spider webs in your hands and that you can use them like it doesn't really line up to there's some there's some whimsicalness about it, that, that yeah. kind of thing. It's yeah. basically magical powers, magical thinking, wish gotcha. fulfillment, things like uh -huh. that. So cool. being able to being able to swing like that from from yep. skyscrapers or yep. being able to to you know move your hand in a certain way and cast a spell. This is all very early. So I suppose um I haven't ever played this, but like World of Warcraft stuff. I, I assume like definitely, yep, heavily. would be like that because like wizards and potions and things. Yeah, know? Warcraft, I would say the content actually kind of goes is. from magenta to amber. Yeah, makes sense. Yep. Okay. And probably has orange themes and orange gameplay. Sure. So that would be, that'd be my, my analysis of, of Warcraft. So this next one is another fantasy games. Fantasy games are great to put into the magenta bucket for all the reasons that we just said. This one is interesting, and this is one of, just so you guys know, one of the best games I have ever played in terms of world building. I'm going to say that because all these games I chose are some of my favorite games. So you're going to hear me say over and over again, yeah, yeah. this is you, my you... favorite game. I'm never going to lie to you. They're all my favorite games. This is a game called The Witcher. Actually, The Witcher 3, uh, which now has an amazing Netflix series if you guys haven't checked that out. So The Witcher 3. Dude, I don't know about <laughs> But yeah, you got to start with sexy girl here. Uh, it, it features magenta and red content. Uh, it's got amber and orange themes. It sort of takes place in a renaissance, a magical renaissance world. And then it's got uh, red gameplay. Again, you're mostly playing mm -hmm. in the, from a single That's perspective. Cool. Yeah. And mm -hmm. your job is to be a hero yeah. and to save the day. So so this one fun. feels like squarely like in that analysis makes real perfect sense to me. Yeah, yep. cool. And then, Ryan, I know this next mm. game is one that we're both very excited about. Uh, this is another great example sure of Magenta, I, I think. Like this bed. is, Provided guys, one of my favorite games, one of the best games I've ever played. I'm seriously going to be a real Yeah, no, I, no, I think, like, I don't throw that term around a lot, like, and even kind of regardless of my relationship to the game, and I haven't even finished it yet, it just is striking. It's not even the kind of game I typically play. Yeah. I'm usually playing, like, you know, Halo, Battlefield, yep. uh, Destiny. 
but it was striking. It is, to me, one of the best games ever made, just like objectively. You know? Absolutely. And that game is Horizon Zero Dawn. Yeah. And, you know, there's there's so many cool things to say about this game. And one of the coolest things is that it takes place in Colorado and it has. Yeah. Like, yeah. That was really cool. Like post, post, post apocalyptic depictions of, uh, you know, it's got like Red Rocks Theater and a number of other Colorado landmarks, which is cool. And it's got robot dinosaurs, which is about as rad as it gets. I mean, come on, y'all. Robot dinosaurs? Robot dinosaurs. <laughs> I mean, look at that. Look at that giant brontosaurus looking thing. So Horizon Zero Dawn, it's got magenta red content. So, the sto you know, you're basically, you're playing a tribal warrior who's trying to make sense of this, this bizarre post-apocalyptic world that they've inherited with all sort of the remnant technologies that were left behind. It's got amber to an orange theme. This is a lot about sort of good and evil. There's actually a lot of dialogue. There's a lot of sort of moralizing. I would say humanistic moralizing in the theme. And it's another one that's got red gameplay. You're being a hero. One thing yep. I think we'll notice is that red gameplay is oftentimes, oftentimes leads to some of the most fun gaming experiences out there. Yeah. It's fun to be a hero. Yeah, totally. And this game, I'd say, uh, because it's so good, um, and and how it was developed. I mean, really, like what they ha how they created the game to, in terms of technology, like to make this world is was pretty innovative and revolutionary. And it's a really satisfying, immersive world in so many ways, including the storyline. And because it's so well made, it's it's hard for me to like pin it down more than even any other game on the list because I can like see every. Uh, most of the levels you know even even potentially someone playing this game could feel into green here depending on on yeah. their orientation interpretation there but it's beautiful it's like you want to feel like magical that's there in spades you want to feel like a hero that's there you want to feel that you're doing something for a group of people you're there you know right. uh the all the machinery and the strategy you know it's all there it's it's yeah. quite wonderful and and it's all under girded by this orange science fiction story which does yeah. also has some green tones to it there's a green kind of po you know green tone, yeah in the in the storyline and i'll tell you what normally i don't give a shit about stories in games like it, it usually it's a it, it's it gets on my nerves i'm just like i just want to play the game but this one i actually pay attention to the story so yeah it's a great story and it really stuck with me so uh play this game if you haven't the next fantasy game is uh, Divinity Original Sin 2. Uh, and man, this game is epic. It is a masterpiece, a top-down Dungeons and Dragons style hmm. uh, uh, strategy fantasy game. And it's it's incredible. I mean, this is, hmm. this is sort of the pinnacle of the formula from games like Baldur's Gate and Icewind Dale and a couple other uh, nostalgic pieces, which I'll show you guys in a second. Um, but, you know, and I wanted to also mm -hmm. take a moment here to, to sort of, well, first off, let me describe this game. This game is is magenta content, magenta to amber themes, and orange gameplay. It's a strategy game, and it's a fairly deep strategy game. You're playing with spellcraft and different special attack moves and dial endless dialogue options. That's where a lot of the orange and even sometimes maybe a little, a little green comes in, uh, where the dialogue options actually shape sort of you know the story itself. Um, it's very, very complex game, but it's all within sort of the idiom of, you know, magic and, you know, swords and sorcery and uh, Dungeons and Dragons type stuff. Um, and I want to take a moment, Ryan, to actually talk about Dungeons and Dragons, because Dungeons and Dragons, again, is an influence for so many of these games, particularly fantasy games. So many of these games sort of fell in the shadows of Dungeons and Dragons. And to me, Dungeons and Dragons is actually a proto integral game in so many critical ways, mm. right? So, I mean, even from the level of like character development, you're literally playing with levels and lines. You have strength, dexterity, intelligence, wisdom, charisma, mm. constitution. These are all lines of development and they all have different sort of skill levels associated with them. So you got levels and lines right there out of the gate. The alignment yeah. system, which has two axes, right? It goes from good, neutral, evil, uh, and it has lawful, neutral, chaotic. Um, everyone knows chaotic good is the best alignment out there. Um, but even yeah. that, the alignment system is looking at interior morals versus exterior ethics, mm -hmm. right? Here's mm -hmm. what I believe versus here is how I conduct myself in the outer world. So it's mm -hmm. got these again, these proto-integral impulses packed into hmm. Dungeons & Dragons uh, for hmm. the last, what, 40 years, hmm. um, which is incredible. And so many games have come out of 
uh, sort of the D&D rule book. Yeah, totally. Cool. It's this beautiful combination of like math geekery and like role playing and storytelling. Uh, yeah, which, which I'm gonna have to check this one out. I think it's it's it lights up both hemispheres of your brain. Nice. Now, one thing I'll mention is that for each of these buckets, Ryan, I I chose a couple time capsules. Yeah. And so each of these, I'm gonna show a couple games um, from my own childhood, maybe from yours too, maybe from the childhood of people watching. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, these some of these games. Uh, made such a deep impression on me i was i was at such a formative age when i played these games and one of those which is a direct precursor for games like divinity original sin was a game i played on my commodore 64 called pools of radiance nice which uh yep i had a commodore 64 as well did you m128 yeah this game just blew me open just blew me open and this is a literal dungeons and dragons game so it's using Dungeons and Dragons rule sets. It was one of the first major games to do so, to really quantify all of the, you know, subtleties and complexities of, of Dungeons and Dragons rules and put it into a game. And this game just like blew the RPG genre wide open. <laughs> um, I get so much nostalgia from this game. And, you know, similar to the previous game, this is, you know, this is a game that would be magenta content, magenta <laughs> the amber themes and orange gameplay. It's another strategy game. This is awesome. One of my uh, two of my favorite games on the Commodore 64, and I'm not sure where they'd be at. Um, I don't know if you played them Lucasfilm games, uh, Maniac Mansion and Zach McCracken. Yep. Uh, uh, I love those. I don't know where I'd put them at. I don't, I don't know either. Probably so, you know, red, some, maybe. Some of those are like wordplay games, so they might even be kind of magenta. You know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, magenta. Yeah, I know. I love them. You, know, you got to come up with the right words in order yeah. to. Yes. Right. So this game even has a heritage, though, and I'm going to go even further back in the time capsule. To show you my first RPG, which got me so excited for video games. This game like haunts my memories. And it is from, uh, along with this game here, from one of my all-time video game, all-time favorite video game developers, uh, Strategic Simulations. And this one is called Wizard's Crown. And I've just been waiting for an excuse to play footage from this game mm -hmm. on Integral Show forever, uh, just for pure nostalgia's sake. Look at this game. Whoa. This looks so blocky and ugly, and yet yeah. when I look at it, I can still, hmm. I can still remember how I saw this when I was like ten years old, right? Wow. Yeah. This was, I mean, this this was it. This was the most complex, glorious <laughs> game I had ever played, and it was one of the first big RPGs that was based on statistics and skills and and all. Hmm. Look at this battle scene. Just look at it. that's glorious. I I I miss those graphics. That's awesome. Yeah. Wow. And in fact, I'm so enthusiastic about this game and about this uh, video game company that I'm wearing their shirt today. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> that's that, my, that, that logo seems familiar. Yeah, I remember that now. That's my that's my geeky video game shirt. Dude, nice. So uh, let's uh, let's change buckets again. Yeah. Yeah. So now okay. we're gonna go. Now we're gonna go to the most fun genre. Yeah. So now we are going into red. And we're going to start with some Fortnite. Yeah, there we go. Now, funny enough, I've never played Fortnite. I played it. Yeah. You have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you're, I mean, it's really interesting because like you can, a lot of times you're playing solo, in which case very much red, just like every person literally for themselves, either, you know, combination of surviving or killing. You know, mm -hmm. um, so it's interesting that you can have some of the survival instinct. Actually, I would say that that brings it up pretty strongly here. I tend to go the survival route and just like see if I can hunker down and not get anybody to notice me for a while. And um, but you can also do pairs of like uh, two on two and then four on four too. So it can yep. expand a little bit. But you know, it's it's pretty much yeah, like shoot them up, you know, kill the uh, other yeah. people. And I was focusing in particular on the Battle Royale. Aspect. Battle Royale is what's Battle really Royale. unique about this game yeah. is that format is Battle Royale where it's just like everybody for themselves with an element of either surviving to the end or killing everybody in order to survive, you know, That's the right. combination, yep. And Battle Royale is the perfect, perfect analog for red game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That perfect analog. Every person for themselves. And right. yeah, and you can see in the screen here, um, like modern kind of orange, Orange presentation, content. orange content, houses and stores and things like yep. that. Yep. Yep. This game um, has orange content, red theme. Yep. Again, the theme here is survive. Yep. Kill everyone else and survive. That's yep. 
the whole yep. goal here. Yep. Uh, and red gameplay. So yep. orange theme. Yep. Red theme, or I'm sorry. Yeah, orange this is red theme, red gameplay. Yep. And then the whole system, ecosystem around it in terms of the stores and buying all your outfits and things like that. So there's a heavy orange market component to it that's like yep. unique. You don't have to pay for Fortnite, but you yep. pay for all the your special outfits. Yep. I'm so personally I, I, John Wick in the game. <laughs> <laughs> so as I mentioned, you know, first person shooters are often associated with red, even if the content of the shooter can be pulled from any altitude whatsoever. The next game I'm going to show is one of my personal all time favorite first person shooters. This was uh, the reboot of another classic game that I remember playing on my Commodore 64, uh, which at the time was called Castle Wolfenstein and got rebooted in 2014, I think, as uh, Wolfenstein the New Order, and this game is fucking... Which one are you showing? You showing the old school? Right? No, I'm showing new school, man. Oh, yeah. Because this is one of the best first yeah. pa first person shooter campaigns. Was, was Wolfenstein the... Was that the first, like, RPG, like, in color on computers? I was trying to remember, because I remember playing this in high school in the 90s. What was the game? Was it Wolfenstein or another one? There was. I think it was I'm Wolfenstein. Sure. There was a Castle Wolfenstein. Which no, no, was I think it's... Down. Yeah, I remember playing it in high school in the high school and computers like in 92, There, there was a whatever. 3D Wolfenstein that was a really big deal that came out along the same time as like Doom and Quake and all those. Yeah, yeah, that was that, it. That's yeah, why I played. That's probably the one you remember. So this is the reboot of that franchise and it's glorious. It's, this is such, it's, it is brutal, absolutely brutal. So this game takes place in sort of a Philip K. Dick world where an alternate reality where the Nazis won World War II and uh, have colonized the world. And so in this game, you're playing as the Resistance. Um, and it is, it's a chilling game. Um, it's a game that's, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> after the events of the last couple months is probably, um, I don't know, maybe has a little bit of newfound relevance. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a really good game. It's brutal, like I said. Uh, you know, your, your, your goal is to kill Nazis. That's the whole concept <laughs> of the game, is Nazis yep. are bad, Nazis are evil, kill them dead real good. I so that means that the content of the game is red to amber. Uh, the theme of the game is amber to orange. Not only are you, is there a clear good and a clear evil, but there's also orange, re you're, it's taking place in this orange science fiction yeah. alternate reality type of world. Hmm. Um, and again, red gameplay doesn't get more red well maybe it does in one of our future selections but this is a perfect <laughs> example of red gameplay your, your job is to kill every single motherfucker on the screen <laughs> which, the gameplay. which yep. is another funny thing to me about red first person shooters right is that you yep. know we, they're, they're the most popular genre out there yeah and yeah every single one has the same gameplay the entire goal is yep. to line up various objects on your screen into the center of your screen and then yep. pull the trigger when they're lined up Yep. That's it. That's yep. the game. Yep. And it's endlessly satisfying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> watch people's heads explode. That's <laughs> right. That's what the games are. So, yeah. Wolfenstein, New Order. Then they followed up with New Colossus. And it is just, um, the storytelling is amazing. The world building is amazing. And mm. it is just a way to p exercise pure, gleeful bread. Which nice. also brings us to the next game. Talk about gleeful bread. So the next game is Grand Theft Auto Five. I still haven't got to play it yet. Really? I know. I need to. I need to just play it. You, know, I just play you really it. need to just play it. Um, this game is is. Uh, I mean, it's a sandbox. It's, it's uh, yeah, sandbox game. You know, it's incredible. And you know, it was interesting placing this game, Ryan, because um, you know, Grand Theft Auto has orange content. Sure. It has an orange theme. The story is being told from an orange perspective. However, and 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 you can play this game. How you can play this game as a pacifist if you you can play this game and never run a single red light if you want to, right? Sure. But <laughs> when people think of Grand Theft Auto games, they only think of one thing, and that's just total mayhem. Yeah. And that's totally. what Grand Theft Auto is. You can. Yeah, I mean, it it, it it lends itself. You know, it's like being in a candy shop and saying you don't have to eat any candy you know you're probably going to if you're hanging out there all the time that's right <laughs> yeah it's just pure may mayhem uh on a definitely egocentric level yeah i mean yep. just like 
can you get away from the cops? How many, like, I don't know. I've heard things about the game. Like how many people can you beat up? There's all kinds of stuff where it's just like, wow, this is really letting, letting the person rip in, in red territory. Yep. And I will, and I will say this, I, Ken and I actually had a great conversation about this uh, a uh, year or two ago. Um, we both agree video games absolutely do not contribute to violence. In fact, it's kind of the opposite. The reason why we have such demand for violent video games is because we have sort of some violent shadows in our culture. And right. if we were to address those shadows, chances are the demand for violent video games would come it'd be down. Re it'd be reflect, it's more of a reflection versus causative. However, <laughs> I told Ken, I have a memory one time when uh, this was like maybe 2000, I don't know, three, a long time ago. So it was a very old iteration of Grand Theft Auto. I remember playing the game for something like eight hours straight uh -huh. with my cousin before I, and I had to work a night shift that night. And um, I played and played and played for just eight hours straight. And then when I went to, uh, when I went to walk to work, yeah. I was walking across the street and there was a cop car that pulled over another car. Uh -huh. And I swear to God, I had to actually fight off the impulse uh -huh. to jump in the cop car and drive away. Like yeah. this was a real temptation that he well, made. You like, know, like it was nothing. Cause that's what I've been doing for the last eight hours. Yeah. And so totally like, just kind of like with anything else, context matters. And like, so if a person has some issues they're dealing with in their life in terms of mental health, uh, you know, certain video games or certain video games can exacerbate their, their issues or that, that activity can can exacerbate their problems so that that's really true of anything but it's just sort of like if you play the game does it going to be like necessarily you know impact you such that you're going to go out and behave totally differently than normal? no but if you play enough of a game yeah i mean like i it know uh, experiences it creates state experience and those state experiences fade but they you know it can take a minute for yeah them. for sure for sure and and granted that was one of those games where i'm like okay if i were going to like have any caution with any, it would be like, oh, I'm gonna make sure that, that game would be like one where I'm like, how am I gonna play this game? <laughs> there are far worse, I promise you. Oh, I'm, no, I know. Far more sociopathic, I should say. As as for the most famous games, let's put it that yeah. way. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, so let's get back to it. So we've got another, here's another example of, I think games that um, you wouldn't necessarily think of them as as red games, but they're definitely set in a red world. And for that, I'm thinking of some particular Assassin's Creed games. Mm. Um, so I chose two in particular to highlight here. The first one is Assassin's Creed Origins, where you are in ancient Egyptian society. You get to climb a pyramid. You get to go into the pyramid. You get to go into the Sphinx. This is like childhood dreams come true right here for me. Um, mm. I've always wanted to see the pyramid and I never have. So this kind of mm. gives me some substitute gratification in a certain mm. kind of way. Yeah. So these games, these two games in particular, um, are taking place in a red world. Again, this is ancient Egypt. And the next one I'm going to show is Assassin's Creed Valhalla, which is, um, you know, Vikings. You get to be a Viking. Mm. Um, so, which is, you know, sort of, uh, red to amber. But, the, you know, the theme of the game, these are science fiction games. There's a whole science fiction meta mm. story being told across all of these historical bits um, that's very orange. Um, it's got an orange view of history, etc. So it's got a, a, a strong orange theme and more red gameplay. Because, again, if you're playing as a single player, you're trying to be a hero, sort of the yep. definition of yep. red. Um, yep. So this one was Assassin's Creed Origins, and I'll show a little bit from Assassin's Creed Valhalla. Uh, which is a gorgeous game. I have this on the PS5 and it's beautiful. And you get to be a Viking, which is another childhood dream. Is this made by at all by the same company as Zero Horizon, Don? No, but there's a lot of, it looks, Gosh. It looks really similar. There are it? a lot of things where it feels, I mean, just really similar. Yep. Yep. And this is just a, it's, it's a really beautiful game. I, I, this, this is uh Valhalla is in a lot of ways, a capstone on Assassin's Creed. Cause the Assassin's Creed series got very, gluttonous you know yeah. like one of my favorites is assassin's creed odyssey which takes place in ancient greece and it's just huge i mean there are literally hundreds and hundreds of hours of like side missions to do so when i play the game i just get kind of overwhelmed and i stop playing for a while um this game is nice and tight everything's more focused you, you get a, it, it, it's, it's got a better experience i think um so it's assassin's creed valhalla so now we're going to go into the time capsule ryan mm-hmm <laughs> And we're gonna go for probably the most red game ever made. Yeah. Red content, yeah, red totally. theme, red gameplay, yeah, red yeah. in all three lines. Yep. Yeah, yeah. And not only that, but this is the game that put first person shooters on the map. 
to begin with. No surprise, we're going to Doom. <laughs> yep. What a revolution this game was. Freshman year of college is when I when I played Doom. Ah, uh, nice. I played it on my girlfriend's uh, old Macintosh, and <laughs> uh, it just spent hours and hours and hours playing yeah. this game, memorizing <laughs> the levels. And it was so scary, and these graphics seemed so real at the time. I mean, this was as immersive as video games got. And yeah. so incredibly innovative. This was the first 3D, uh, you know, first-person shooter we ever had. Yep. And it's glorious. If you ever, yeah, if you ever want a, a fun 10 minutes, watch a speed run of, of Doom. They beat this game in, like, 10 minutes. It's, it's absolutely mm. That's awesome. Yeah, classic and, and, right here. The whole speed running thing, that's that maybe that's something we could mention at Orange because that is uh -huh, totally you know, high score competitions is a uh -huh. great expression of orange. Speed yep. runs are an expression of orange because you're trying yeah. to be the best among a number of people. Uh -huh. uh, we'll maybe get to that later. So yeah. this is Doom. I just want us to kind of savor it because um what an important and landmark yep. this was. So now we're gonna go into a new bucket, Ryan. And we're going to yep. go to uh, a game that you and I and Vince Horn have had a lot of fun in. Mm -hmm. Battlefield 5. Yep. And uh, here I'm focusing not on the single player campaign, but on multiplayer. Yeah. Particularly on the team oriented multiplayers like Capture the Flag, uh, etc. Yeah, this game, out of games uh, similar to it, really does emphasize the team play given that there's different roles that you can play, you know, like. Uh, medic or uh, scout, you know, um, you just have specifically different roles and you really, it, it's hard to play the game if you try to be a, a red solo person. It's just, yep. you have to play as a team. Exactly. You can, but your team will lose. Your team will lose. Yeah. Like, so you, you're forced to play it. It's, even though if you know, you're firing guns and things like that, you got to play as a team, which yep. is really cool. It's a really cool mechanic. Yeah, no, it, it really is. And you need like actual communication and strategy and, and all of that. Um, and in fact, in fact, I mean, get rid of sort of the cognitive aspects of Amber, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, not even necessarily thinking or communicating or all that. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, the best way to win this game is to simply follow everybody else wherever they're going. So there's sort of a yes. mentality. Yeah, 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 absolutely. I'm going with you guys, and as long as I stay closer to you guys, we have a better chance of winning. I'm not yeah. even thinking about strategy. Yeah, because there's other games like this where, like, sometimes you can, you know, if you're a quote Billy badass, you could just kind of run and gun and and lift your team up. Um, but this one is just like, mm, yeah, there probably is true. Like, I know there's gonna be people who are just amazing, but a lot of times it's just like follow the pack. <laughs> right. Which is true in any war. You, I mean, you have genuine war heroes, and then you have everyone else who's, yep. you know, actually doing 99% of the fighting. So this was a great game to start with because this is strong amber content, strong amber theme, strong amber game. Yeah, and the, and the scoring, too, is not just like a lot of games like these. You know, the score is just only like how many kills there are. But with this one, you have different points for doing different things, like helping the team out. Yep, yep you get points for, uh, for, for healing. Uh, you, you can actually you can actually rank fairly high in this game without ever fighting without ever without ever board. killing anybody yeah yep um so yeah so a great example of of amber very similar to this game another game we've spent numerous hours playing um but actually shows a little again shows why these three categories are so important is uh destiny 2 multiplayer so i mean almost the same exact uh, dynamics destiny as battlefield 2. yeah seriously right the only difference between this and Battlefield is the content. It's got orange science fiction content instead of mm -hmm. amber military World War II content. This for me is still the best. Destiny 2. It's it's one of the most balanced shooters. I mean, no, no, Destiny. This is Destiny 2. No, Destiny, the first Destiny is the, my favorite. Anime. Oh, is it really? Because yeah, this is the current one, Destiny 2, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, no, the, the first one was just level up. Interesting. They really went back. I didn't know you felt that way. Yeah, but it's still great. They're amazing. Well, it's got some of the best gunplay of any of these. Mechanics are, are one of the best, yep. Yeah, yeah. And that's, it, by the way, just to go back to Wolfenstein, that's one of the things I really loved about Wolfenstein was that the gunplay just felt, it felt heavy, it felt weighty. You could feel the impact of every shot. Um, it just, it felt good. And there's certain yeah, things. Yeah, yeah. It just feels good. It feels good. And you know, and one thing here too, one last thing to say, like what's, what's different about these games versus some of the other red games where you're just firing guns. 
with these kind of games, usually, I mean, it's just always beneficial to talk with people, like with your team. You're always going to do better. Like it's always, if you see on the screen, you're with three random people and then the other team all have the same gamer tags. You're just like, this is going to suck because they're all communicating and coordinating. So it emphasizes uh, an us, but only us. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So now let's move to another kind of amber game. Uh, this is going to be a game that's more uh, amber content and even amber themes, uh, but has orange gameplay. And that is another one of my favorites, a game called Crusader Kings 3. This just came out last year. Uh, it's one of the best games of the year, if not the best, honestly. And this game is basically, um, it's a feudalism simulator <laughs> slash story generator. Uh, it takes mm. place between the 9th century and the 15th century. Um, you get to learn really cool terms like, you know, uh, you know, here's one of them. Uh, agnatic cognatic primogeniture. Who knows Whoa. what that is? Sounds Dutchy. dirty. <laughs> it does kind of sound kind of dirty. <laughs> that just I means women are allowed to take the throne only after all male inheritors have died. Oh. That's all that means. Oh. But Sounds you get to learn cool that. things like that. Um, and at first glance, you know, this looks like a basic kind of conquest game, like a civilization game, for example, mm -hmm. which we'll get to later. Mm -hmm. but it's really not. Um, it's, it's, it's more about the actual relationships that mm -hmm. get formed between all these different, you know, because that's what feudalism is. We, we think of like medieval history as like, you know, England went to war against France. Well, that's not actually how the feudalistic world worked. There was no real unit that people thought of as England and a unit that people thought of as France. It was more like this family, which controls these territories and has these duchies, et cetera, went to war with this family who controls the, and as soon as the control of those territories changes due to, you know, whatever sort of ongoing events, that war goes away. So this wasn't like nation state against nation state because that didn't really exist yet. Mm -hmm. So this was more about the intrigue and the drama and, you know, mm -hmm. marrying your, your daughter off to some mm -hmm. king in some faraway country. And, well, and, you def I mean, definitely this kind of, these kind of games, I mean, you just look at automatically you feel into that like sociocentric level of game of, of, of way of being and game totally. uh, gaming. Yeah. Yep. It's really, really obvious. Yeah. And it's a story general. I mean, this game, this is one of the two games on this list today that have probably the steepest learning curve. It's an intimidating game to wow. get into because most people don't know feudal history. Yeah. <laughs> it's a, the game does a good job of, hand, of holding your hand. It's got a great tutorial system and tool tips and all that. It's got endless depth. But the really cool thing about this game is you don't need to know any of that. You can just sort of play, watch it play itself out, just d make the major decision points and just get a story. Um, it's a story generator more than anything. And it's, you can even... <laughs> execute the pope and replace him with a cannibal <laughs> you can turn christianity funny. into a cannibal religion if you want to in this game and that's, that's fun. just cool <laughs> all right so uh now we're gonna go again into the uh time capsule i'm sure everyone's gonna recognize this one right away perfect amber game <laughs> on a perfect amber screen <laughs> Tetris. So why did I choose Tetris for this one? Um, you know, Tetris, I think, is a perfect example of a game that is based almost entirely on concrete operational cognition. Yeah. And just to remind people, you know, concrete operational is a stage in Piaget's developmental unfolding. Uh, typically, you know, hits kids around eight years old up until about 12 years old or so. And this involves a logic of physical objects. So this is the first kind of reason, the first kind of logic that begins to come online. We learn, you know, things like proportionality. Um, we learn things like the conservation of matter that you can take, you know, uh, a, a, a wide glass of water, pour it into a thin glass of McKill, it'll know it's the same amount of water. So this is where a lot of, you know, really important logic skills come online. And Tetris, I think, just nails it. You've got, you know, these pixels that are all made of four blocks. They can fit in somewhere. Your goal is to stack them up in a certain way and clear. I mean, this is mm -hmm. this is sort of the pinnacle of concrete operations. Yeah. Um, and I love presenting it here, A, because every single one of us, every single one of us has spent hours on this game. <laughs> and now there's like all kinds of versions of it, but yeah. 
it now that's the thing ryan this game now looks like this so you know i love it when games evolve and this game has <laughs> evolved quite a bit i have this on my oculus quest 2 so i play this in virtual reality oh yeah and holy jesus is it gorgeous and uh. in game it's got a couple of wrinkles in there a couple of new challenges but it's gorgeous. I mean, look at these backgrounds, which are simultaneously and you know absorbing and distracting. You know, yeah. um, and the music is just kind of you know. Let me kind of. Oh yeah. It's definitely a sexier version than the old Game Boy one. <laughs> yeah, it's got this like real sleek, sexy interface, and it's you know it's it's just as addictive as. The original Tetris was on my Game Boy when I was a kid. Yeah, totally. And uh, the other cool reason I wanted to bring up Tetris here, because we're about to make another shift. Yeah. We're going from amber to orange. We're going from concrete operational to formal operational. And I feel like there's an interesting pattern here. So with Tetris, you're playing with these little pixels and you're trying to fit them all within a box, mm. right? Yep. The next game takes us from concrete operational to formal operational. We're still playing with pixels, but now we're able to think outside of the box. Yep. Yep. And that's Minecraft. Yeah. I agonized on how to categorize Minecraft. I really did. Because, Ryan, as, as you point out, there are yep. just so many different ways to enact this game. Mm -hmm. um, yep. but, but I had to make some decisions. So let me, uh, I'll tell you what I decided, and you can tell me what you think of it. I decided this was orange content. I mean, it's you're still playing with objects, you're crafting, you're you know you're you're living in, in uh, you're you're assembling and yeah. constructing things. Yeah. Out of real realities. Yep. Uh, it's got an orange theme, which mm -hmm. is craft, build, create. Mm -hmm. You know, these mm -hmm. are all very orange impulses, uh, mm -hmm. and it's got an orange to green gameplay. Um, the orange gameplay is, again, simply uh, think outside the box, take all these pixels and make something new out of them. Uh, uh, this is a sign of formal operational thinking. Mm -hmm. You can do whatever you want now. Here's the building blocks. Make whatever you want and make it glorious. And people do. Yeah. This can also be, uh, can also have green gameplay because people collaborate and make these incredible yeah. creations together. And I consider most co-creative games to be green. Some can be orange, but they're mostly sort of, they have that green kind of uh, intentionality mm -hmm. behind them. And, and mm -hmm. Minecraft has, you know, it's versions of that. Yeah, yeah, totally. I think it's a, a pretty right on. Yeah, so there's so much that's um, cause and effect in this game, you know, uh, the constructions. And then also there's a lot of mechanics where something will trigger another thing in the game. You know, there's results and a uh, chain of cause and effect. And uh, to, in talking about like formal operational, there's a part, I, I forgot to bring this up, but um, there are these devices that if you go look up how they work in the game, you get this page on the wiki that is just full of math that goes, that is just like, I'm like, I can't, I don't, I'm not gonna get this right now. Or like, maybe I could, but I'm gonna have to go back to algebra and things like that because of all the permutations, like literally math equations on like how these things will trigger um, like electric circuits and things like that. So you have that level. It's, so it's like, it can jam on that one. Or you can play the game in just an artistic way and say you, you, you use everything in there in order to make beautiful um, presentations, you know, like you might use a fence, but not for a fence, but for art aesthetic purposes to create something. Um, there's also like how you play the game, like right collaborative. You can do that where you just create worlds together. You do it in peaceful mode and not even about survival. It's just like, what can we create together? This will be fun to do. Um, or you can battle people like I think some people do that. Mm -hmm. um, and then like how you play the game, you can do it. Like, for example, on a farm, you just build a little farm like you would expect normally. Or there's ways in which you can exploit the game. So it shows like the, the, the downfalls of, of an orange you know, materialistic capitalistic world where like I saw somebody put like a, a llama in a glass box that has a mechanism where it automatically shaves the llama to get the wool off and it drops into a box. And this is just llama is just living in this glass box. Now in the game, it never dies. So you're not really killing anything, but it just shows you, it's just like, how can we get the most without doing, without doing anything? So how you play the game matters a lot, you know, right. in this. Right. but it's really interesting that like, little kids can play this and enjoy it yep. i mean it spans the spectrum it's really fascinating that it's that open to people um kind of almost regardless of where you're you're 
uh, level is at. Now I can tell like, you know, there's limitations for like a five-year-old, six-year-old, but they can still get into it a bit, like with some help. <laughs> they know how to tear down a tree. They don't know how to tear build down a tree. complex circuits, but they can, you know, tear down a tree and make a wall. Yeah, a circuit it. thing. I just have to follow instructions. It's too hard. Yeah, no, exactly. So, you know, this is, this is a great, this was a great example of orange. Yeah. I'm going to shut my window again. real quick. Yeah, sure. Go for right. it. Uh, no, I'll just say, I, I love, again, sort of this transition from Tetris into Minecraft where it's still sort of pixel based gameplay, but one is very much in the box, concrete operational, and one is very much thinking outside the box, formal operational. Yeah. And you have to have an, another level up to really yep. do everything in the game. So now that we're in the orange bucket, a lot of these games, you know, you mentioned yeah. math, Brian, a lot of these yeah. games are really, really emphasized math. Uh, mm -hmm. This next game I'm going to show to me is one of the most orange games ever made. And it's a game that I have put, it's, it's one of my top three games in terms of like the number of hours I put into this game. It's called Factorio. And again, this game is glorious. You, you, the whole premise of the game is as orange as it gets. You are creating a factory to create yeah. various things. You have to create things in order to create more complex things. In order to create more complex things, your eventual goal is to get off the planet. You're trying to build a, a starship to get yourself off of the planet. However, the entire game is composed of conveyor belts, right? You can actually watch the extract sources from one place. It goes up the conveyor belt. It goes into a furnace. The, the iron gets converted into steel, and then that goes through another conveyor belt, and other machines combine that with copper to make microchips and then you got to take those to make your science pack so you're making these like big spaghetti kind of conveyor belt factories and it's all logic based like you can look at a video like this and it looks overwhelming and you can't make sense of it but if you're playing this game every one of those conveyor belts makes perfect sense because it's taking a resource from point a delivering it to point b so that it can be turned into a different resource which then gets brought to point c and, you know, another reason why it's as orange as it gets is you land on this planet, which is already inhabited by this like intelligent insect race, and you're creating pollution with your factories, which is pissing off the native population. So they come in to destroy your, your factory. So you have to, <laughs> you have to nice. fight them back and destroy yeah. the native population so you can extract all the resources and Pretty get off orange. the planet. It's, it's as orange as it gets, man. Yeah. That and was, I love it. It was super orange. I great. love these kind of systems. Yeah, yeah. There's so many games like this. Yeah, I'm, now I'm thinking about it. Yep. And then that this is going to take us to another uh, math-based simulator, which is another one that I have spent countless hours on, and that is Kerbal Space Program. Uh, again, another game like the last. Orange mm. content, orange theme, orange gameplay, mm. orange across the board. So this is not so much a game as it is a simulator, though it's kind of gamified. And the point is to build a rocket using real rocket parts and some, you know, maybe exaggerated rocket parts. But you have to build a rocket that has enough thrust, is aerodynamic, and etc. that can escape the Earth's velocity and then can orbit the world. This is the game where you literally learn orbital mechanics in order to play. I mean, it yeah. the game turns you into a mathematician. Yeah, yep. and you're you're figuring out, you know, apogees and. Paradigms. Yeah, I mean, this is like, uh, you know, in like flight simulators and stuff, you know, like where I could never get into them. They were just they hurt my head too much, like to to do all of the coordination on them. But, you know, one game that I've seen recently that I've I've seen some videos. I don't know why through YouTube recommendation that kind of cracked me up is. Uh, it's one that people play on now where they it's like running airports and stuff like yeah. running them. Like yep. I forget what it's called. Micro is it Microsoft something or other? Or uh, the one that I play is a fairly recent one. I think it might have been called just Airport Tycoon. But Tycoon games are all other, you know, orange. Yeah, but this is like one where like you have collaborative, like uh, world environments or, or people where you, you interact with strangers and stuff, and like you're controlling a tower, and like people are flying their planes in and landing, and you have and you like some of the people the way they play them is what's entertaining to me. Like you have somebody who's like really doing like inhabiting the whole aircraft controller uh roger that 249er can you uh, hit the taxi to run whatever, whatever they're saying you know it's just hilarious but that's all it is it's just people inhabiting these worlds of flying planes landing planes and cracks right me up. it actually reminds me of another uh game that would be perfectly actually amber to orange which is uh there's a star trek game bridge mm. commander mm. where that you play in virtual reality and everyone has a role and you're on a mission and you know one person's the engineer the other person's 
on weapon station, the other's the uh, captain, yeah. and they all have to coordinate, right, in order to yeah, 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 yeah. In, in real time in virtual reality. That's another great amber to orange role based um, yeah. strategy game. Yeah, totally. So Kerbal, uh, highly recommend this to anyone out there who uh, just likes math, who likes building things, who wants to see, you know, what is the weirdest thing that I can actually push up into orbit? People come up with all sorts of just bizarre contraptions um, and they actually, you know, make them fly, which is, which is fun. Um, this is, this is a sandbox that you can easily spend a hundred hours in and just be like, where, where did my time go? <laughs> oh man. Um, yep. Next orange game, another one that's just orange across the board, all three categories. The Sims, perfect representation of orange. I mean, you've got a character, you are deciding what they look like, their appearances, their haircuts, their clothing. When you go to design the house, you're finding your furniture to put in there. You're having, you know, very modern relationships with other yeah, Sims yeah. out there. I mean, this is just a, a, a purely orange, kind of flat, but that's yep. okay. Most yep. orange games are. Yep. Um, but, you know, another wonderful representation of an orange video game. Totally. Classic. Yep. My wife has spent um, a lot of hours playing Sims. She's playing yeah. another game these days that's further down the list. Uh, oh, okay. Soon, but yeah. The Sims was, uh, when I first met her, it was all about, I think it was Sims 2 way back then. Yeah, I remember playing it a bit back in the day. It's... Yeah. Putting your putting your Sims into swimming pools and then taking the ladders away? Yeah, yeah. It's just like, I think that's what's entertaining to me is like some of that silly stuff. <laughs> you, see, you can play any game as red if you want to. Yeah, <laughs> totally. So speaking of great big time dumps, yeah. this next game is notorious for that. This is uh, the Civilization series. And I chose Civilization 5 instead of 6 because this is the best Civilization. 6 is good, but 5 just like, especially with all the mods that they are, all the, uh, the uh, DLCs that they put on, it's, it's exquisite. Um, and this is, you know, his civilization is a very, one of the most famous game properties out there. Mm -hmm. um, it takes you again from Neolithic to space age eras. It's a game that, you know, it's funny if you're an integralist playing this game, you can easily enact it as teal, right? Because you have, you're, you're bringing your understanding of sort of integral development to the game. Yeah. You know um, what, well, I, just, very orange. I know um, we're going to, we're going to talk probably later about like, what, what would we think would be like you know, uh, higher level games and what would it be composed of. I like a lot of these as foundations that come in orange, but the mechanics that are involved often have limitations because they were created from the orange mind. So the game is imbued with and limited via orange. So even with a, with a higher developed mind, there's just, you can't enact it. You know, like there's not enough nuances. And I'm like, this is where like the next level game could emerge with maybe enough computing power and things like that. Like, I want to see this game two notches up you know yes. and then i'd be like whoa that's, that blow my mind yep 100 percent. and we'll we'll talk about some of our yep. fantasy games later because i'm 100 yeah, yeah. on the same page with you yeah you know this is sort of like you can take the surfaces and sort of you know enfold it in your own way so if sure you know, like when i'm you know when we're in sort of agrarian technology stages of the game i'll yeah. i'll inhabit the game as if my people are at that stage and they make yep. it based on that and yeah. changes when they hit the, the industrial revolution but you got to bring that yourself to the game there's nothing in the game that's you know gonna gonna bring that to you um right. but this is this game is famous for you're up at 3 30 in the morning <laughs> you, you've got a deadline in the morning and you're just like one more turn click oh, <laughs> yeah, one more turn click yeah totally yep um so now i want to go to a different flavor of orange um so the orange games we've talked about until now have been very math based, have been very, um, you know, this is very kind of conquest based. Um, this next game, I think actually speaks more to the spirit of Orange than anything else, sort of the, the ambition and the discovery and mm. sort of the embrace of the unknown and the curiosity um, and the beauty really of Orange. And this is a game I've been spending I've spent a lot of times, a lot of time with over the last several years, but for some reason, in the last couple of weeks, um, I put a lot of time into this game because it's just, it feels like self care in a certain kind of way. <laughs> um, it's just so endlessly relaxing. Yeah, nice. That is a game called No Man's Sky. Mm. Uh, absolutely gorgeous. So, this game is again orange across the board, orange content, orange to green theme. There's a couple of little postmodern elements, but it's mostly orange science fiction. 
uh, with orange gameplay. It's a, it's a crafting based game. It's actually a lot of crimson stuff in there too, because it's survival based. I mean, you start off with no resources and you got to put together the things that you need to survive, but then you got to find your starship and you got to go up and trade resources. What's interesting about this game is that it's, it's procedurally generated. So there are literally in this game, millions and millions, if not like a billion different planets, each of which is unique and generated procedurally so that they all have different creatures living on them, mm. uh, different aesthetics, different plant life, different geological form formation. Mm, that's cool. I played this game in virtual reality and is one of the most satisfying wow. VR experiences. Like this part here, when you're going from the surface of the world into space, I mean, you feel <laughs> you feel that. I mean, it feels like you're going somewhere. It's cool. Um, and, you know, you get to like board enormous spacecraft and space stations. And the whole game is just based on the feeling of discovery and the feeling of, of exploring something new. And it really lights up that orange uh, in a, in a mm. just very powerful and tremendously aesthetically pleasing cool. way. Nice. Yeah. So I, I, I love it. You know, what's funny about this game too is uh, this was one of the most overhyped games when it was released. Yeah. It's kind of like a game that recently came out, Cyberpunk, where it was so overhyped and it was released with like serious issues that totally damaged its reputation. Like, like ah. Cyberpunk is a joke now. Yeah, this that's game, weird. They kept working on it and iterating it and improving it for like five years. They're still doing it. They're still working on it right now. And it has just, it, it became even more than the game they originally promised. Um, which awesome. is, it shows even more of that orange, sweaty dedication to get something right and to achieve something with excellence. Mm -hmm. uh, these, these guys did it. Cool. These guys. Uh, so now we're going to go into the time capsule, brother. Nice. Again, another game that I'm sure all of us have played in some form. Sim City. Yep. Orange Gosh, I, look at that old version. Yeah, I, I intentionally chose. I think this is the DOS version. I was looking oh for the Commodore gosh. 64 version, but I couldn't find it, so I went with DOS. Wow. Um, but yeah, I mean, let's just look at these graphics. When was the last time you saw this? Um, wow. I got so happy when I. Yeah, the know, last game I was like played. The last version I played was a lot newer than that one. I don't know how many years ago, but that's awesome. Yep, it's classic. Absolutely classic. And what's funny is that there have been many iterations of this game over the years, and but they all kept the basic formula. Right, which is the basic formula of city planning itself. You have your yeah. residential zones, your commercial zones, your industrial yeah. zones, um, and yeah. then other you know, airports and other, you know. And then all of these games have been building on that formula until today we have today's version of this, which is another game I spend a lot of time in, City Skylines. So this is the modern version of SimCity. Uh, it's a city generator. Really, if you take a closer look, it's more of a traffic generator. Traffic is one of the most difficult things to manage in this game. And it's exhilarating. I actually uh, have built a version of Boulder in this game, which only wow. got so big before my CPU started conking out and I couldn't oh, wow. it anymore. Yeah. Right now, uh, I just got Shadow PC, which is giving me uh, you know, sort of a cloud-based computing service that gives me more power than my MacBook has. So now I'm rebuilding Longmont. Uh, That's in, awesome. Like perfect scale Longmont. Like this is how long the roads wow. are. All wow. the roads exactly where they need to be. Basing it off, I'm tracing a map. I'm superimposing. Wow, that's nerdy. Right it there. is a legit version of Longmont. It's. I feel like it's like when our grandparents would play with model trains. Yeah, that's awesome. Yep. So that's City Skylines. Love it. Now we're going to go to another game. We're going to go from one bucket to the other. This is a game that um, has become very important to our both of our families, I think. Yep. Particularly after this last year. I think this game yeah. is important to a lot of families. Ryan, why don't you talk to us about Animal Crossing? Oh, Animal, well, hey, you were the one who uh, sold us on this uh, game uh, for the pandemic. And yeah, it's really in, it's really enjoyable. One thing to say is that like the whole family can enjoy it at, at different levels. So that's really fascinating. It's always cool to see a game like that, but um, it, yeah, there's just something really, I mean, obviously green, so much green here, right, in this game type. Um, it's about, you know, creating a pleasant island, you know, that's enjoyable to live in. It's enjoyable for the residents who live there. It's not as uh, wide open, you know, as like Minecraft or or uh, like, you know, SimCity, you know, but you can see here just looking at this thing, like, look at it. It's just, 
Oh, looks like a lovely little place to hang out. Yeah. You know, exactly. and it's collaborative, you know, because you can, you have the family, you, all the family plays on one island on one device. So you can't, you can only have one island. If you want another island, you have to go buy a whole another switch. You That's know, what my family switch. did. Yeah. Yeah. And that sometimes people do that, you know? Um, so uh, sure. there's not like, there are some little orange elements in there, you know, yeah. but, but, you know, for example, you do have to pay off your, your house, your loan to get, uh, but it's like really chill. Like it's not hard. It's not sweaty, anything like that. But other than that, you know, there doesn't feel like this overt, like gold driven, um, uh, gameplay. It's just like, what do I want to do? I want to put a little path here. I want to put a little, whatever, little amusement park over here or whatever it is, but there's no like, um, orange, uh, those over orange goals, but you're leveraging things like that, like construction okay. and, and uh, um, there's not like a whole overt strategy, you know, to it. There's a, there's like a lovely museum where you can have um, the local wildlife there displayed for everybody to see, you know, there's a museum right there. Yep. Um, it's really, I'm still in the, in the middle of creating my island. I haven't peeked out yet. I still need to get some more rooms in my house. <laughs> the orange part there. I haven't um, played in a long time, so my house literally has cockroaches in it. Yeah, they give you some cockroaches in there. Yeah, um, yeah. I don't yeah. Know. Well, it's very I was, relational. Like very, very relational. So, um, you know, let me, let me. Yeah. This has been a tough year for quarantine, and particularly, yeah. you know, as you know, when you have this a was kid, a game for quarantine. This was 100%. a game for quarantine. When you have a kid, quarantines are tough because um, kids need, you know, they need to go outside. They need. Um, you know, uh, socialization experiences. Uh, my kid, because we've had to be extra careful during all of this, um, you know, has been doing school from home. She's not having yeah. any contact with other kids. It's a, lo it's a lonely place. Mm -hmm. And this game has been um, solace for her. Mm -hmm. You know, she plays this game with her uncle Richie, who lives in mm -hmm. Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. They visit each other's islands. She plays with my wife, her mother. Um, you know, they play together and they have quality. You know, the funny thing is my kid goes to bed and my wife keeps on playing for hours until she goes to bed. So it's yeah, like yeah. both totally immersed in this game. And it's yeah, been yeah. Mm -hmm. it's been it's been a solace, a source of solace. It's, it's really yeah, it is it's like it really is a perfect game in this last year because um it's not sweaty. It's not like you are there are things you can do, you know, like oh I'm gonna go get some more bells so I can get a couple of things, but it's, it doesn't feel sweaty, like a ch super achievement oriented. It's just really lovely to pass time in. It's aesthetically mm -hmm. pleasing. Um, and it's great because you can pass up the control. It's like, oh, you want to play? Yeah, like we, my stepdaughter, Fiona, is like, yo, oh, you want to play a little bit? Okay, no, you want to watch mommy play? Okay, mommy's going to play now. Oh, I'm going to play now. <laughs> it's really- I will, I will say this though, Tom Nook is a crook. Tom Nook is the is the orange element of the game. <laughs> you should have been, been Tom Crook, man. Tom running, Crook running this island real estate pyramid scheme. He's the only one. He is the the little orange. Gentleman. But really, again, like even with the achievement thing, like in terms of beating the game, it's funny you do it like in no time at all. And like if you're used to like playing a game, like oh, is there an end game? And you realize it like happens in like hours, you know. And, and so there's not an emphasis on end of the game. It's just like it's it's funny because you'd say an open world, but it's not an open world in terms of like procedurally generated things. But it's an open environment. It's a you sandbox. Know, it's, it's a sandbox. sandbox. Yep. Yeah. So I I classify this game as largely orange content, you know, because it's still mm. it's things you're getting. Yeah, yeah, things. You're placing things, things and all that, but uh, you know, green themes, and yeah. uh, and uh, green gameplay. Yep, totally. It's the the point of this game is to relax. Is relax. Yep. 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 All right, so let's go to our next postmodern game. And I got to say, this is one of the most postmodern games I've ever played. And I wouldn't be surprised if this game has flown under the radar of a lot of people watching right now. It is called Disco Elysium. And I could go on for hours about this weird ass postmodern, beautifully cynical game. So this game has green content, green theme, green gameplay, green across the board, masculine, philosophical, deconstructive green and it's beautiful it's beautiful i actually can't tell if this game has a green theme or if it's actually criticizing green from a teal point it's so hard to tell because yeah. it so embraces its own sort of malaise mm. Um, mm. but it's a bizarre role-playing game where there's no combat everything is dialogue everything is dialogue so there's already sort of a you know an orange to green kind of quality right there you regularly you regularly talk to parts of your own mind and your own brain. One of the prominent characters that you spend a lot of time talking to is your own lizard brain. 
all of the skills, you know, again, Dungeons and Dragons, it's like strength, dexterity, intelligence, you know, all that stuff. All of the skills in this game are aspects of your own mind. So it's got things mm -hmm. like empathy, volition, uh, and even mm -hmm. something called visual calculus, which sounds a little bit like vision logic, gotta mm -hmm. say. Mm. It has something called a thought cabinet, <laughs> where instead of really interesting, instead of wielding a weapon, mm -hmm. you wield a thought, and that thought comes to sort of it gestates and comes to fruition as long as you have it in your thought cabinet. And those thoughts can be things like communism or feminism or uh, the mistaken belief of the rock star. Um, and it it creates huh. all of these different neuroses and pathologies. I mean, it is such a deconstructively introspective game. Um, you know, and again, it sounds quasi integral, but it really, really is one of the most postmodern, um, yeah. cynically funny and deconstructive games I've ever played. I mean, you play this game for a few days straight and you're going to have probably a fairly bleak week. Um, but that's underselling the game because it's totally, but yeah, really that's the other version. I mean, like, that's what we talk about with green and postmodernism. You know, you have like some, a lovely game like Animal Crossing, you know, and then you have the, the, the kind of a polar opposite in terms of, of vibe, you know cynical this is another really really beloved franchise and i think it's just dripping with postmodern critique so that is a little game called bioshock so for those who haven't played this game um, it takes place in an underwater city uh which is basically uh designed off of the premises of ayn rand's objectivism <laughs> So this entire game is actually a green critique of orange pathological objectivism, um, individualism, all of that. And, uh, you know, so it's got orange content. You're literally seeing, you know, all this kind of, I mean, look at the art deco kind of style, which is itself very orange, very, very modern, but it's criticizing everything through a green lens. The story is being told through a green lens. Um, it's it's clearly trying to deconstruct the prior stage um, and the pathologies from the prior stage. And man, what a game. And by the time we get to the third in the series, uh, Bioshock Infinite, it's just, it goes full on like Euroboric, t eating its own tail, postmodern. Um, it's a beautiful experience. It's a bewildering experience. Um, but what a cool game series this was. Nice. Someone says uh, Disco Elysium, the last game we talked about, definitely has some second tier vibes. Yeah, I agree. Um, I, you know, and I was trying to point those out, but I still feel like it's such a, a green deconstructed mm. game. Mm -hmm. So I, I included it as green. Um, so Bioshock is, uh, if you guys haven't had this experience, play Bioshock, it's still very much worth playing. Um, have you cool. played this one, Ryan? I haven't. So just mainly <laughs> monogamous gamer. I have a hard time <laughs> tracking them all. <laughs> So now let's go into the time capsule. This is the this is one of the only two games on the list that I haven't played. Maybe you have, I don't know. I'm sure a lot of people on our list have. This game is actually known as popularly the first postmodern game. Hmm. And that was Metal Gear Solid 2. This is also the youngest game on our uh, nostalgia list. This was released in 2001. Hmm. The 21st century game. I was really trying to keep the time capsule to like 80s and 90s games. Mm -hmm. uh, but this one, again, it's lauded as the first postmodern game. And for good reason. I mean, this game, again, it came out in 2001, 20 years ago. So it makes the 20 year cutoff. It's history now, right? Um, this game predicted fake news, the a perspectival madness to come out of the internet. Uh, there are really, really weird gameplay mechanics where it becomes clear that the main player in the game, Raiden, is actually a projection of the player himself. And the game actually crosses that bridge. It breaks down the fourth wall, which is a very postmodern storytelling device. There's one point in the game where it actually tells you to turn off your console while you're playing and then to turn it back on in order to get to the next section of the game. So it's it's wow. action and it's pulling it off the screen into your, wow. it's telling you to turn off and reset the system. Wow. The story. Wow. There's another part later in the game where it glitches out, you're in the middle of a, of a fight and it makes you think it's a video game glitch. And it's, you know, and it gives you like some messed up message on there. So it's it's got all of these really, wow. really postmodern oh, story. Yeah, totally. Devices to it. Wow. Uh, green across the board, green gameplay, Green yeah. content, green theme. Neat. Yep. So 
we're going to take a momentous leap here. There we go. So let's talk about this. First off, um, teal games are really hard to nail down. Mm. Um, I chose a few examples here. People could argue that they're orange games. People could argue that, you know, they're... I enact the following games as teal for these reasons. I think that teal games rely on largely two things. I think that A, there's often an emphasis on something called emergent gameplay. So this mm -hmm. is what happens when you have dozens of different systems that are all working in the background and rubbing against each other in various ways, mm. producing unpredictable results mm -hmm. that even the developers themselves couldn't have predicted. Mm. Mm -hmm. This creates a lot of opportunity for novelty, creativity, and fun storytelling. Right? Yeah. So I think that's one characteristic of a teal game. Uh -huh. Another one is a game that plays with perspectives or at least makes a place for perspectives. Um, and I think that the, the teal games that I've chosen here sort of do that. Um, and I'm not sure, again, how popular these games are with our audience. Mm. Um, another thing we'll notice is we're getting into these higher, <laughs> higher uh, tiered games, higher altitude games. The resolution drops quite a bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think like we're going to see like in upcoming years here, like the emergence of, of these levels just because we need powerful systems to be able to, to do emergent gameplay, you know, the more systems you got running, the more processes you can have going on, more mm -hmm. levels in the game. <laughs> totally agree. No, totally agree. And I think that this first game I'm going to show, which has been in development for something like 15 years or something crazy like that, <laughs> ongoing, it's still available to people for free. You can play this game for free right now if you want to. But along with Crusader Kings 3, this has the deepest, steepest learning curve of any video game I've ever come across. Wow. And that is a game <laughs> called Dwarf Fortress. This is what Dwarf Fortress looks like. Wow. It's all ASCII, right? So it's all, you know, keyboard symbols and the interface is all keyboard. It's bulky. It's cumbersome. It's yeah. kind of ugly, but it's deep. Wow. It's deep. So th this is one of those colony management games where your job is to be a colony manager. So what does that mean? You are not necessarily controlling any individual dwarves, which are your colonists, but you are setting the jobs. You are, you know, sort of creating the workflows and then your dwarves go and do all the things that they're supposed to do. Now, this game has the most complex interlocking systems I've ever seen of any game everywhere. I mean, any encounter, like literally every part of every dwarf's body has a system to it. So they get into a fight. They can like your, your, your third toe on your, on your left foot was decapitated by a, you know what I mean? It gets like really nitty gritty, wow. which allows for a lot of really, really cool gameplay. Now, the thing that turns people off about this game is what it looks like for one. Uh, and the user interface, which again is very, very clumsy and archaic. So they're in the process mm. of modernizing this game for Steam. So it's about to look less like this and more like this. Huh. Which, come on, that's night and day. I mean, it still looks like a yeah, yeah, totally. video game, but yeah. you know, that's way more accessible. Huh. Um, so endlessly complex game. And um, again, it's a, it's a story generator. One of the points of the game, one of the sort of the slogans around it is losing is fun. The point of the game is to, is to fail and to fail in a glorious way, kind of like Crusader Kings 3. Yeah, it's fascinating. I see here it gave, it influenced Minecraft. I see it here in Wikipedia. Yep, yep, wow. it's a big influence for Minecraft, absolutely. Yeah, and you, like you said, losing the, the resolution of the game. It makes sense because you're trying to, they're trying to do really, really complex stuff around emerging gameplay, but doing it in the limited systems that are that are available, so it's like exactly. yeah, yep. That's more computing exactly. power. We're gonna see more. <laughs> yeah, this this is the type of the game that like amps up your CPU. Yeah, it keeps your GPU nice and nice and cool. Yeah, you know what I mean. It doesn't it doesn't tax your graphics very much. Nifty. Um, the other the other piece about this, you know, the other thing I I think makes it integral is that each of the dwarves in your colony, each of them has mm -hmm. their own first person motivations their likes and their dislikes and all that. They have second person relationships, right? Mm -hmm. And these relationships give them various degrees of happiness or unhappiness. And then they have their third person skills and roles and things like that. So again, it's making wow. a space for these perspectives and all three of those different kinds of motivations create even more emergent gameplay for the dwarves individually and the dwarves together as a group. Wow. Sounds nuts. Have you played this a lot? 
I've I've played this a ton, but not as much as the next game I'm going to play. Okay. So the next game I'm going to show is simultaneously a simplification of Dwarf Fortress, uh, but also sort of an improvement, um, at least in terms of graphics, uh, certainly in terms of accessibility. And I got to say, this is the game I have spent by far the most hours of my life playing. <laughs> I'm a little bit embarrassed. I'm not going to show you a screenshot of Steam <laughs> because it's embarrassing. You know, people say it takes 10,000 hours to become an expert. All I can say is I'm about to become an expert in RimWorld. <laughs> RimWorld, one of the most unfortunately titled video games in history. <laughs> um, I'll let you guys come to your own. <laughs> Uh, unsavory jokes about it but this is another <laughs> colony management game and it shares a lot of the qualities with dwarf fortress except it looks prettier even while still looking like a 1998 game huh. but i'm an old man i have a lot of video game nostalgia as you can see from this presentation so i love these graphics i love these graphics um so same type of thing every colonist has their own first person needs and wants and desires and drives and motivations their second person relationships and marriages and family connections. Um, if someone in your family dies, that colonist is going to be very unhappy and that's going to affect their performance and that's going to affect the colonist performance and that's going to piss off other colonists who can have a mental break and they can attack another. So it's again, all of these systems, all of these things that can go wrong, it's basically a Murphy's Law simulator. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Fascinating. So you can see here they're mining, they're building farms. They're um, it starts with that survival impulse, uh, but it's a story generator, um, like so many of these really really great games are. Mm. Uh, and in fact, I'll show you the actual launch trailer for RimWorld, which I think um, which has some audio to it, which will show some of the stories that are possible. Mm. By the way, the answer is over three thousand. I've spent over three thousand hours playing this game. It's pretty good. To be fair, it's been over like eight years, but that's a lot of. All right, so let me let me cue up the shallow video because it's hilarious. It's kind of adorable, and it shows you what uh what RimWorld actually is. You might think this colony humble. It was no simple undertaking. The three of us crash landed here. Elena, a princess. Manual labor is unbecoming. Greg, librarian. Good with books, not much else. And what use is a washed up soldier like you, Nelson? <sighs> now we are survivors. We built, mined, harvested. Endured frightful conditions. And manhunting rabbits. Beastly pirates raided us. We captured some, recruited others. We lived new lives. Entertained ourselves in time. Greg and Elena married. One must compromise one's standards here. For company, we tamed turtles. But not everything could be tamed. Greg started to drink. You wouldn't stop cheating on me. Others know how to treat a lady, Greg. That was when Greg broke down and ran naked into a lake. Yeah, well, let's not forget when Nelson hung out with his llama all day instead of building solar panels. We all need downtime, Greg. Despite everything, there was progress. We began work on a ship to set us free. But there will be no escape today. This is my base. This is my sanctuary. And this is my palace. This is our colony. So if you've been watching this right now and you think all of this has been building up to an infomercial for RimWorld, <laughs> you're, you're basically right. I want everyone to hear <laughs> That is hilarious. Um, stop the show there. Nice. Yeah, the other thing I like about RimWorld too, Ryan, is that you're, you're, you're actually, when you're managing the colony, what you're doing is you're managing these colonists individually and collectively. Mm -hmm. You're managing their interiors and their exteriors. Yeah, you can see, I mean, that's why, you know, we've already broken record at this point but like yeah you can see finally you that trying to pay some attention to all quadrants but have to do it in like a really 
really strip down way in some aspects like the graphics or whatever so that way you can allow the complexity on other levels um and uh hopefully you know again i i think with more computing power we can do that in a more full-bodied way you know i'd say three-dimensional not just in graphics but like in the feel of inhabiting the game that's right uh, yeah but this is like this is where you're at and you can tell how much how complex those two games are that you shared you know of what you'd have to do to get involved in them and that's kind of you know as you're pointing out i mean you know it's it's uh in terms of inhabiting games like this it gives you all the opportunities to but you're going to inhabit that game according to wherever you are mm -hmm. in your own development so i'm you know uh hopefully more integral than not these days so i'm able to enact it and i'm able to see mm -hmm. how i'm in yeah yeah your life you you know this kind of reminds me of ken's myth of the given there's no single video game here. It's actually a different video game. Well, it makes cosmic address that plays it. Well, especially a game like that, you could imagine. I mean, like, too, like if it, once the the user interface is better, where it just like maybe it doesn't require as much. It's not as sweaty to get into the game. For example, if you have better user interface things like that, but still, you know, let's say it's like running a colony or a, or a civil civilization. Well, a person might run it like a red civilization because that's going to be possible in an integral framework um so but like that's what we're talking about there is like what possibilities exist and with these games you get more and more possibilities for uh the dynamics and nuances and gameplay you know that's such a great point yeah no totally and and a game like rimworld or dwarf fortress actually gives you those stories all the way up and down the spiral yeah, yeah, so yeah. you start off like i said you start off and you need to survive you need to collect resources find food build shelter etc so it starts with crimson your mm -hmm. next step is to solidify your relationships, to find more colonists, to grow your colony, to create trust between your colonists. The next stage is to like, red, fuck up anyone who comes into your territory mm -hmm. and tries yeah, to yeah. take your shit. You kill yeah. them dead, right? Mm -hmm. And then there's Amber where you're, you begin actually forming relationships with other colonies around you and, yeah, yeah. and all that. Uh -huh. and then orange where you're building new things and crafting and, uh, right increasing your technology levels and so it's you can enact the game however you want in fact the game sort of forces you to enact it differently depending on what stage of the game you're actually playing cool makes yeah. sense so now we've got a uh, another time capsule and time capsules for teal are are tricky because let's be real guys integral games don't really fully exist um yeah. if they do only you know again you, you kind of have to squint your eyes a little bit yeah <laughs> stretch it a little you know but this is a game I'm about to show that has, I think, some strong integral signifiers built into it um, year, decades ago. Uh, and this was actually made from uh, the same guy, Sid Meier's, who created uh, Civilization series. So this is Sid Meier's Alpha Centauri, um, which is basically kind of like Civilization, except in outer space. Um, and it looks like this, because it's a very old game. So it looks kind of like old versions of civilization, but this is taking place in uh, humanity's far future. And it's interesting when you're going to choose your civilizations, they give you like, you know, eight civilizations to choose from. When you read the description of each of the factions, it's literally like they've read the Spiral Dynamics book mm -hmm. and created a faction for each level. Oh. Like a faction that is clearly magenta. There's a faction that is clearly red, hmm. clearly amber, clearly orange, clearly green. And guess what? Clearly teal and turquoise. Hmm. Clearly. I mean, like in how the factions now, this is an old game. So I don't know how much of that lore actually. Yeah. Right, play, right. 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 But yeah. it was creating a space. It was using hmm. content, what I think is strongly integral content. And then there's the premise of the game here. I'm just going to read this from Wikipedia while you watch these janky old graphics. <laughs> Um, tell me if you think this sounds remotely kind of, I don't know, tealish. Mm -hmm. The player discovers that the planet is a dormant, semi-sentient hive organism that will soon experience a metamorphosis which will destroy all human life. Oh, that sounds pretty green, actually. Mm -hmm. To counter this threat, the player or a computer faction builds, quote, the voice of Alpha Centauri secret project, which artificially links planet's distributed nervous system into the human data links delaying the planet's metamorphosis into a full self-awareness, but incidentally increasing its ultimate intelligence substantially by giving it access to all of humanity's accumulated knowledge. 
Finally, the player or a computer faction embraces the, quote, ascent to transcendence, in which humans, too, join their brains with the hive organism and the metamorphosis to godhood. Thus, Alpha Centauri closes with a swell of hope and wonder in place of the expected triumphalism, reassuring that the events of the game weren't the entirety of mankind's future, but just another step. Interesting. Yeah. Some strong teal language in there. Yeah, that's interesting. Building so off a lot... of green themes, which I thought was interesting. Yeah, so again, a lot in the story and the lore of it. Mm -hmm. yep. Nice. So now, brother, yep. we're going to go to the hardest stage of all to find any even just trickle of a yeah. game to be there. Uh, and that's turquoise. So just to remind people, teal is sort of... Uh, intro level integral consciousness turquoise is more mature level integral consciousness mm -hmm. so what is it what is a turquoise game going to involve um that's i think one of the first questions it's probably not necessarily going to be action driven it's probably going to you know try to evoke certain states of consciousness it's probably going to play with perspectives i think in an interesting way might even play with holons in a, in a fairly interesting way um, so I had a hard time finding games for this bucket, yeah. but I did find one. <laughs> so let's do this. I'm going to close yeah. the show with yeah. the full, with the full 10 minutes. Sounds good. Um, because that's, we'll, we'll treat it as a closing meditation because yeah. that's what this nice. game is. Um, it's a meditation. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show some of this, but I'm going to turn the audio off and we'll talk about it while it's playing. Um, and then I'll show the full video at the end. Uh, Cause I think it's an, it'll be a nice way to close things. Cool. So this is a game called Everything, and it does all those things that we just talked about. It um, really emphasizes state experiences. It really emphasizes perspective taking. It does so in a sort of janky, again, low mm. resolution graphic presentation, which I find just absolutely endearing. Um, so this is the game called Everything. And the whole point of the game is literally <laughs> to take perspectives. Mm -hmm. So here we start off, oh, I'm a bear. I'm a bear in the woods. Um, as, the, as the game continues, you start moving. And oh, what a funny way of walking. You just kind of yeah. somersault yeah. <laughs> over yeah. yourself. Um, everything in the game, everything in the game can move. Everything in the game has a perspective. Everything in the game has a perspective that you can inhabit. That's what makes mm -hmm. this game crazy. It's literally a game about inhabiting. And mm -hmm. I'm just going to kind of uh, scroll through a little bit. So here we're still bears. Oh, look at that. But I'm a bear in a group. Oh, now I'm a bird. That's the other interesting thing. Every time you inhabit one of these entities, um, you exist as an individual. You're controlling an individual with agency, but you're also surrounded by a group. You're never mm -hmm. alone in this game. And it doesn't matter what you're inhabiting. You can inhabit uh, Yeah, now we're everything. zooming in. Yeah, you can inhabit an elephant. You can inhabit an ant. You can inhabit an entire planet. You can inhabit a galaxy. You can inhabit a subatomic particle. Mm -hmm. You can, you can inha yeah. inhabit the first ideas from which the cosmos was created. I mean, this is a game that holonically goes from the smallest building block all the way up to the highest archetypal realities. And you can inhabit every one of those holons. Yeah, and sort of like inhabiting kind of exteriors of sorts, like gameplay wise, you know. Um, but it is really fascinating because you can just go all the way up and down, you know. In, the, in that in that realm in a very fluid way, you know, yep. in a very kind of interconnected way. Yep. Yeah, and then here you are, like, look how far out you are. Here you are inhabiting a galaxy. And then, and then yeah, if you saw that triangle that showed up on the screen, you're, that's yep. your scale, that's your holonic scale. So you can go up yeah. and down, yeah, yeah. power into like universal archetypal concepts, for example. I mean, it's got sort of a funny metaphysics to it. Um, and I think we actually just did the, turqu the classic turquoise move of going from macro to micro. So you keep yeah. scaling out and you end up as a piece of pollen or whatever this thing is. Yeah. Um, so that's sort of another. That's super cool. Yeah, I, um, I uh, got it downloaded last night. I haven't got to try it out, but I was going to try it out because it looked like, it just looked fun, really interesting to, to, to play around with. And it's yeah. basic in terms of graphics, but like when you think about how many layers they're trying to include the complexity there, they have to keep everything else really, really simple yep. <laughs> yep. for computing's sake. 
That's right. And they make a couple integral errors. Like here, you're obviously inhabiting social holons and not individual holons. Come on, guys. You can't inhabit a seashell. <laughs> yeah, this is seashell's a, a social holon. That's a heap, not a hole. Come on. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting. Yeah, this is a cool game. But here's yeah. the thing. So I'll, I'll stop sharing this right now. And again, I'll play the full 10 minute because um, mm -hmm. it's, 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 a, it's a pointing out instruction, really. Mm -hmm. The teaser for this game is a pointing out instruction. And I'll, I'll yep. play it. It's I, all based and inspired by Alan Watts. Yeah. I think it's good. I think it's good to show that uh, uh, as it is because it shows the raw gameplay because, you know, the the powerful voice and words of Alan Watts definitely like adds a bunch to it. But that's sort of like, you know, you could play any game and slap some pointing out instructions over it and it might change how you're feeling in that moment. That's what those do. But this one obviously pairs incredibly well of like, and the words that he uses are really tie in quite well to like what's happening in the game. So it adds another dimension to it. In fact, that's something I'll, I'll ask people to notice when they see the full clip. So yeah. you saw the surfaces, right? You just saw the exteriors of how the game is mm -hmm. played. Oh, what a funny way that bear tumbles through the mm -hmm. wood. You know what I mean? You saw, you saw the silly surfaces. Yep. I want you to notice your experience contrasting because it's going to be the same visuals. So you're going to see the same things again, but this time it's going to have Alan Watts speaking yep. over it and just, just notice and the difference. Um, and, uh, notice, notice how the game comes alive and that it, it suddenly yeah. is a game of interiors. Totally. Um, those pointing out instructions. Yeah, and Corey, before we wrap up, because I'm, I'm going to take off here um, before you do the clip, um, just to, we've already kind of mentioned like a, what, what would be a game look like, you know, that would be at these higher levels. And we kind of already hinted at a lot of it, but for me, once there's enough computing power, these levels can be applied to any sort of thing. I mean, that's life. It's like these developmental levels show up anywhere in life. So once there's enough computing power there, like we could see it in different forms. It doesn't have to be the, the colony colony sort of generator things makes a lot of sense given what what's available in terms of programming and things like that or this game here makes a lot of sense given what we have but i think i'm really fascinating uh, fascinated when we're able to have the emergent gameplay that's key it seems like like where unexpected things can evolve and, and happen not set automatically by a, a limited parameters or limited pathways um, and then being able to interact with them um, with the game from different, uh, the different quadrants, you know, like really, like where you really feel like that, where some games it's like, no, this is all about a subjective experience. No, it's all about a totally objective experience, but to where I could, where you can really feel just like you could slip in those layers, like we just saw in everything where you could really slip in, not just through those layers, but slip in completely to a relational dimension, slip into like a, you know, social systems, uh, perspective of that when that happens that'll be pretty mind-blowing to me <laughs> beautifully no absolutely agree i mean yeah let's look at some of the integral-ish games that we showed it's largely yeah. what you're seeing is the lower right quadrant right yeah. you're seeing the entire colony and the people moving in it yep yeah. you can enact the other quadrants the other quadrants are in there but it's not what you're seeing right it's yeah. not the main interface of the game whereas everything you're inhabiting but the funny thing is you're still seeing yourself from third person yeah. imagine yeah. a game like everything in virtual reality yeah, virtual reality, virtual reality probably is going to add a whole another dimension because yeah, it's like, well, Alan Watts, as you hear, like provides this like subjective pointing out instructions, but it's like, well, what if you could just be in that sub you that is who you are in that moment in the game because you're not witnessing third person objective, you know, you're experiencing. And I don't know how much computing power we need or whatever, but like I think that's what I'm hungry for because when I look at the games I used to play, like at that orange level or even some of the green stuff, I'm kind of like, whatever. And, you know, so I just, I go back to old classics, you know, like shoot them up. It's just like, ah, it's just simple and, and good. But like, I mean, like, I'm, I want to play some of those orange system games, but at a, at a higher level would be really fascinating. You know? Yep. Orange games are where I spend most of my time. Yeah. They're where I spend most of it. It's, I get, I get very happy playing orange games. Yeah. yeah. Says something about my development. I don't know, but no, I know they're really well developed games. They're yeah, just exactly. they're they're really well polished, and the and the technology is well suited for them. You know, well, I think what they're still trying to figure out, Ryan, is how to do more high minded games, green games, teal games, turquoise games, that are actually fun. Because again, yeah. sometimes that quality of fun depends on having enough of that earlier stage energy in there. You yeah. need a little bit of red. You need a little bit of orange accomplishment and achievement. You need, you know what I mean? You need yeah. sort of some goals and some guardrails to kind of totally. orient your experience, make it, you know, so that it's a known quantity, so that it's more fun. That's the problem with games like everything. It's a beautiful meditation, 
that you're probably not going to find yourself like, oh, I had so much fun. I want to, I can't wait yeah, to go yeah, back yeah, and play right that there. game tomorrow. Right. Yeah. Well, and games seem like just like, uh, seem to, because of how massive of development is required, trail what we do in life. So, you know, we've done Orange quite well in life as human beings. So it's very easy to make a game because we understand it. Uh, green games are becoming more and more, you know, mm -hmm. uh, solid is because we've, we've been doing that. But it's like, yeah, we haven't, we haven't really enacted integral on major, <laughs> in major ways across our society. So it's like, I don't, you know, this is not surprising that the games might take a while, regardless of technology. There was an attempt, I think, to make an integral game. The problem yeah. is it didn't turn out integral. And that was uh -huh. a game that I, again, one of these games had so much hype behind it when it came out and then it came out and it was just kind of flat. Yeah. Uh, that game was called Spore. Uh, yeah, I remember hearing about that one. And I was got excited about like when I first saw it, but then yeah, I think like when it came out, it was kind of like me. It sort of sold itself as being this, you know, integral holonic, you know, because you're yeah. playing cell, then you're playing as a microorganism, then yeah, you're a macroorganism, and then it's that was an idea. You know, and what I liked it, what I pre the integral impulse there was they were trying to create a game that was multi genre. So like at the cell yeah. level, it's basically a platformer, right? Yeah. At the next level, it's a different kind of game. The next level, it's more like a civilization game. So they were trying to pack in multiple genres into the stack, this vertical yeah. holonic stack, which was integral in a, in a sense and admirable. The problem is they half assed all those genres. Yeah, so I mean, weren't very fun. I know. I, I remember being excited about that game, but I'm just like, I don't know how anybody's going to do that unless you just, we just got to have way more yep. processing power. power. That's right. And it was, you know, it was a game that uh, that was trying to be integral, but ended up being orange Darwinian. It, yeah, it was a flat game, totally. You know? Right. Um, but as we're talking about fantasy games, I've got a similar fantasy as you. Like my dream game is a seamless combination of something like, the Sims, mm -hmm. yep. something like RimWorld, yep. and something like City Skylines or SimCity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, me too. You are, you're managing on multiple holonic levels. I'm managing an individual or family. Yes. I'm yes. managing a neighborhood, right? And imagine I'm managing like an entire lower right complicated. I think, I think that'd be nifty. That would be, and then the ability to like, I want to make policies on one level that then affect gameplay on another level. Yeah. I want like my individual sim to be able to somehow have an effect on the macro level. Like I want that seamlessness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, between all those levels. I'm with you. I'm with you. Basically, I want the matrix. Totally. I think we'll get it eventually. Yep. <laughs> and it's got to have enough red in it to actually make it fun and make us want to play over and over again. Yes. Yep. Agreed. Well, dude. Nice. Well, it's been fun. Jesus, this is a fun like 30 tour. Months. Fun tour, man. Thanks for putting all the clips together. This yeah. is really fun. Now, now it makes me want to go uh, do some gaming sometime soon. I haven't hardly got to do any lately. Well, this is kind of the thing, right? And I probably should have opened up the episode for this, but like video games, particularly for us, for our generation, I mean, yeah. we are the Atari, Nintendo, Commodore 64 generation. This was yeah. what, this was like the, the emerging media of our generation. Yeah. Right. I was born 100%. with an Atari 2600 in my hand. And, you know, I'm still playing my PS5 and my Oculus Quest 2 today. So, you know, yep. in, in a lot of ways, this stuff lands for me in a more personal way than even film or television. It's, it's where I get most of my nostalgia from, yeah, which is why totally. I focus so much on the time capsule fix. Yeah. Um, yep. So this was, this was a fun, fun This guide. was fun, dude. Yeah. And well, I, hope, I, hope, I hope our integral gaming geeks enjoyed it. Yeah. Well, uh, I'm going to take off here. I need to go uh, get to the next things. Um, cool, but I'll uh, leave you all with the, the uh, lovely um, clip from Alan Watts because it is a beautiful, beautiful uh, 10 minutes of, from him. Yeah, I think so. And this is, I think, a nice way for us to leave um, with, you know, again, sort of emphasizing the message of inhabiting and inhabiting yeah. your dreams, inhabiting your reality, yeah. inhabiting your pixels as we'll probably yeah. do the show. Yeah. Yeah. It's all it's all part of that, as Alan kind of points out beautifully. Totally. Here. Ryan, thank you so much, man. Yeah, thank you, man. Always fun. And uh, thank you, uh, thank you to all of you at home who uh, spent Impeachment Day watching us talk about video games. I hope this was more exciting than whatever was happening in <laughs> Capitol. Building. Yes, indeed. Uh, so yeah, thanks everyone. And here is Alan Watts. Okay, see y'all. One of the first things which everybody should understand is that every creature in the universe that is in any way sensitive and in any manner of speaking conscious 
regards itself as a human being. Uh, it knows and is aware of a hierarchy of beings above it and a hierarchy of beings below it. That is to say that wherever you are and whoever you are and whatever you are, you're in the middle. That's the game. Your senses extend a certain direction, in all directions, and therefore give you the impression of being in the middle. Because the definition of a person is where you look from. Now, everything in the world feels like that. And also it has its own kind. You see uh, spiders and uh, hydras and sea urchins and so on don't look very natural to us. We say, well, I wouldn't want to look like that. But they say when they see us, uh, well, what kind of an awful thing is that? And what a lot of nonsense it does. Now, we come here right at the start to an extremely important principle, which is the different points of view you get when you change your level of magnification. That is to say, you can look at something with a microscope and see it a certain way. You can look at it with a naked eye and see it in a certain way. You look at it with a telescope and you see it in another way. Now, which level of magnification is the correct one? Well, obviously, uh, they're all correct, but they're just different points of view. When we examine our bloodstreams under a microscope, we see there's one hell of a fight going on. All sorts of microorganisms are chewing each other up. And if we got it overly fascinated with our view of our own bloodstreams in the microscope, we should start taking sides, which would be fatal because the health of our organism depends on the continuance of this battle. What is, in other words, conflict at one level of magnification is harmony at a higher level. Now, could it possibly be, therefore, that we, with all our problems, conflicts, neuroses, sicknesses, political outrages, wars, tortures, and everything that goes on in human life, are a state of conflict which can be seen in a larger perspective as a, in a, as a situation of harmony. Every minute little fruit fly or gnat or bacterium, I will go so far as to say, is an event upon which this whole cosmos depends. As this thing goes both ways. It's not only that every little organism which exists depends on its total environment, the reverse is also true, that the total environment depends on each and every one of those little organisms. So that you could say, this universe consists of a, an arrangement of pattern in which every event is essential to the whole thing. Now, we screen that idea out of our consciousness just as we pay attention to the figure and ignore the background. So we see one way of looking at things, mainly that the organism is very frail against the environment. It lasts a long time, the environment, but the organism only lasts a short time. But actually, uh, the whole thing is arranged in, in a, a polar system where the enormous depends on the tiny and the tiny depends on the enormous. When you came into this world, there gradually arose into being the sensation of I. And it stays there a while, it goes through a development, and then it drops off. But all the time, everywhere, there are other eyes starting up. See? Whether they be human, animal, anything you like. They be in other galaxies, etc. Always, they're starting up. Now, you would say there is no connection between them. No, in the same way, there is no connection between the molecules in your hand. And yet you say it is a hand. But if you look at it under a powerful enough microscope, the molecules in your hand are miles apart. What's the connection between this galaxy and other galaxies? Well, we can't see any connection. And yet there are gravitational 
uh, swings, whereby they respond to each other and move in a certain collective order. See, what we're doing in this I'm not is not setting down a doctrine, but it is doing an exercise in perception. You can see it either way. You can see yourself, in other words, as existing only now. That's the only you there is. The alternative to that, logically, is to see yourself as everything. And so in all this, you see, when you get a game going of this kind, uh, there comes the point of what you might call emotional investment. When you feel that the outcome of this particular feature in the game is urgent. See, this matters. And it's up to you what you think matters. We teach our children what matters, what's important for them to learn. And we teach them basically that it's important to live. And in a way, every being in this world is torn between going on and goofing off. We feel that's, a, that's the basis of our distinction between work and play. Play is everybody needs some time to goof off. But they must go back to work because you've got to farm and fish and manufacture and produce so that you can go on. But when you see you have this terrifying urgency to go on and feel you must, this is, this is important, this matters, we screen out of our consciousness the fact that this is our own volition and our own game. And the difficulty is that as we become disturbed and anxious about this, it's more difficult to keep the game going. In proportion, as we are frightfully concerned to survive, we start fighting other people. We start clobbering our neighbors and whatever it is, is, all the old fights start. And it is these fights which, more than anything else, at the moment, you see, are endangering the entire human project. But all based fundamentally on the illusion that it's utterly important that we survive. But you see, in all this, what underlies is the illusion that I am going on, that I constitute a real continuity from this moment to the next moment to the next moment to the next moment. What are you afraid of losing when you die? Yes. Uh, everything that you've acquired as an individual and stored in your brain is dissolved and distributed. But at the same time, it is equally obvious that when you die, there won't be following the moment of death everlasting nothingness. So, you can become aware of this tremendous interconnectedness of everything. Just as fronts go with backs and tops with bottoms, insides with outsides, solids with spaces, so everything that there is goes together. And it makes no difference whether it lasts a long time or whether it lasts a short time. A galaxy goes together with all the universe just as much as a mosquito. You can get a certain vision of life where everything is seen to be a complex pattern of rhythm. Dances, the human dance, the flower dance, the bee dance, the giraffe dance. And that's what this all is, it's jazz, you see? This is a big jazz, this world. And what it's trying to do is to see how jazzed up it can get. 
how far out this play of rhythm would go.